right. So our next speaker uh, is uh, a student um, who's you've just started here, haven't you? In September. Yeah. yeah? So um, he's yes, it's all new territory and this is your first time in the UK as well, isn't it? Yeah. So um, you can we've got the subtitles are on. Um, do you want a laser pointer? Yeah. <coughs> So you can advance the slides. Okay. Yeah. yeah with pointers. Okay. Okay. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I am Shahid Fadoshatu, and I'm from Kashmir, uh, which is under the Indian occupation, Abishangi, where I actually uh, am from. So this is uh, just an uh, just contents just an over what I'll be talking about. And uh, this is where I actually am from, and all my collections are actually uh, based on this small plot of land, which is in, uh, which is around 10 hectares, and no more than that. Uh, my old collections are based uh, in that very region only. So, <clears throat> how did I uh, came into Deep Terra? It was actually uh, I started my work as a naturalist. Uh, since my childhood, I had a natural incline towards the natural world, and I started collecting literally everything, and I had no idea what to do with it. Uh, and I started with plants, then moved to protists, which doesn't make sense, and then I switched my focus to fungi because it was fairly easy. Uh, because if you don't know the ID, you can just say microscopy required yeah. and um, that was quite easier then I switched it to fungi oh uh, sorry uh, to diptera it was because of this particular uh, uh, family not this one actually but fungus gnats this is my picture and I had taken it using my own setup that I made uh, and here is the species I collected uh, this species just out of fascination I found it creeping on uh, these uh, small fungi and I collected it just to see if it glows at night because I had uh, read somewhere that chiroplatids uh, glow at night and I kept gazing at it and looking at it the whole night. All that did was just that slimy stuff and nothing else and I had to dump it in the trash. And after two years, I came across the same species, but in different stage, uh, which you can see here, if you can see that, uh, just uh, here you can see it. These are the cocoons made by this creature, and I, uh, uh, I just took it home. And so, what comes out of it? And I share the pictures with uh, Vladimir Bligadro, if I pronounce it uh, correctly. Uh, and he said there were no official records of this genus from whole Indian state. And there was just one record that too from Thorax only. So I collected it and it came out to be a new species. So this is how my journey started into uh, Diptera. And this is my drawing of a Califorid. Uh, and I do these drawings for kids uh, to get them interested into this kind of world. And these are the basic hindrances that uh, to the biodiversity research there. First one uh, is the political instability and lack of resources. It is completely, uh, uh, it's not linked to the rest of the world. Kashmir is a small valley which has no connections to the out, uh, outside world because it most of the times it is under lockdown and other stuff. I'll not be going into that, uh, uh, but there is one more that adds to the misery that is Biodiversity Act which doesn't allow anyone to go there and collect stuff, nor does it allow anyone to collect stuff and send it outside. So there is one more that is biogeography that I'll be explaining in the next slide. Here, uh, they, these maps are taken from O'Hara's catalog of Oriental Technity. And if you can see here, uh, that red line is actually shown uh, in his catalog as the line separating uh, the Palearctic region and the Oriental region, which is actually not the case because I live there and I have seen real differences. This region that you can see there, Kashmir, uh, has not been uh, 
completely worked out. Uh, it's actually uh, nobody has gone there to see actually what fauna looks, what their uh, what the fauna looks like. And <clears throat> here it is. And this is actually where I belong to. These are the Himalayan foothills, the fold mountains that are created by the Gondwana land crash with uh, the Eurasian pla plate. And uh, that is where I actually work. And this is the part of Kashmir I belong to. The upper part you see here is that you see marked as data not available is under Pakistan. And this part is this part is under China. And this is where I belong to this small valley, which is considered to be Palearctic as well as Oriental. So there is always a pain of comparing with both. You have PhD amounts of works to compile the stuff for both the areas first, the Palearctic as well as Oriental, then compare it. And if you are done with that stuff, then you will have to see if the expert might have expert might have put it to some other genus, and that adds to the pain as well. And yeah, uh, this is the line, the actual Pir Punjab range. If you go northwards, I have been collecting from these both areas and going northwards gives you clear Palearctic fauna and going southwards gives you clearly oriental fauna. While I live on this yellow line, it gives you both. So it's both Palearctic and Oriental. Experts do not agree, neither the Oriental experts nor the Palearctic experts to work it out. So we have to do it on our own. Uh, and here is one of the most interesting species we have found. I'll be just grinding over uh, some of the nice, some of the like uh, apparent families that are some common families. One of them is Stratiumidae. Only five species are known from Kashmir, while I collected eight from around my lawn only, from a single log of wood. And this one is an undescribed species of Stratiumis that looks like what you have here, uh, Stratiumis potamida, I guess. Yeah, uh, and this is a nice Stratiumis species uh, that we are compiling so there are obviously there are pros as well as cons to being uh, uh, living there, which is Palearctic as well as Oriental. This one is actually a pro because we are living the genus for whole country uh, with just two species. That is Stratiumis approximata and uh, Stratiums and undescribed species that we are communicating now. And here we go. This is a very uncommon species, uh, Burma brythes anulipes, uh, which is not known from any living specimen. This was collected from Burma and I took the picture. This is actually the first uh, live picture of a specimen uh, ovipositing and it was described from a female. So I have male hair as well, which uh, I uh, cultured in my room only. So, uh, here is one more obvious one, which is clear. You can get an idea from this uh, nice surfed uh, that how much amount of work is needed over there because uh, the, even these obvious species have not been worked out. This is a new species that we are describing and we have uh, uh, we are just communicating this new species that is Spilomia species. And there are many, many more taxa that uh, remain undescribed uh, in that region uh, only because of the reasons I mentioned already. And here's a picture of uh, an acelid. This is my primary focus actually. Uh, actually, I'm just scratching the surface for other uh, other taxa and primarily focused on these nice robber flies. And this one is Machimus, which is kind of mess. And I have around three species, all the three undescribed. And there are many more if you see here. Uh, this one took me around one month to get identified because I had to, uh, experts said that it is Acelella, which is not known from that region. I had to compare it with Oriental as well as Palearctic. Then it came out to be some different genus, Trichomachimus. So I had to compare it with literally with every species known for that genus. So it is Trichomachimus omani. That is a common species over there. 
Yeah, here is what I'm currently focused on. The genus Xenopogon, these large flies, uh, these live around uh, on top of the conifers mostly there. Uh, and I have collected this species that I am describing right now. And there are only 19 species known from whole India and I'm adding two to the fauna. So here is uh, one more uh, fascinating group that is Saprozylic diptera which is a really fascinating group. That one, which looks like a dolly, a dolicopodid, is not a dolicopodid actually. It is a Pseudopomycidae, which we recorded for the first time from my lawn only. So this is a first record of that family from Indian subcontinent. Now you can get an idea how much of uh, amount of work we need over there. And I have many more genera as well. Olasigaster, Periscalis. Nobody has ever even touched that. And so uh, that is the amount of work we need. And this is, uh, and these flies are mostly known from melee straps only. So I did uh, some sort of photography with their uh, coach behaviors and other stuff, and we published it in Zoo Texa. So I had not to go anywhere to get these photographs. I just sitting in the lawn, took these pictures and get them published. And uh, here is these feeding on slime flux and guarding their uh, territory. And there is a lot of work we need to do. And uh, if you might be interested in my setup, this was I created this setup when there was a seven month lockdown, complete internet clamped down, uh, all the communication services were down. So I invested my time uh, doing these silly things uh, and I made it out of uh, literally out of trash and there's a, there's a, it doesn't cost even 170 pounds. So I made the setup. All the pictures you saw there, the stacked ones were taken with this setup only. So. And we are trying uh, to uh, get more people associated with us uh, because we are just scratching the surface. We are just giving them the, them the directions where to start from. So we are actually uh, creating a baseline data uh, that is not possible. We are just a group of four or not more than four people. So we need more people to get their own taxa and work them out uh, well. And creating a database is a necessity, and we need that uh, for separate database for that region. And finally, these are my students looking at the flies through microscope for the first time. They do not have access to any of these uh, facilities anywhere, so I take them sometimes for collections and show them how the world look, uh, looks like outside their classrooms. And that's the kind of work we do. And that's it. Thanks for listening. Thank you so much. OK, do we have any um, questions for Suhaib in the room? No? <laughs> yes. Very exciting work you're doing. Um, I was trying to get an idea of how sharp that boundary between the Oriental and the Palearctic yeah, or fauna is how, how sharp would you say it is? Yeah, uh, to me uh, it is not that sharp because it is a mountainous range, so it's not that sharp. Uh, on the mountains you'll find both, but if you go down uh, on uh, towards the north you'll get more of Palearctic, and towards the south uh, you'll get clearly Oriental. Uh, John's asking what the the distance is. Well, you're saying that the mountain range is. This is the the smaller one. It's not the kilometers. Which one? The range? Yeah. It's just continuous range. It is around. Uh, it's hundreds of kilometers. Uh, that uh, the boundary is uh, actually hundreds of kilometers, and it has not been clearly marked. How wide is it? Uh, and it's around. Uh, uh, I don't know exactly. I'll have to look that up clear figures I can give you. OK, any more questions? No? Victoria, do we have any questions in the chat? OK, well, I think we are done. I think everyone's exhausted. <laughs> I certainly am. Uh, OK, thank you so much for that. That was really interesting.